Welcome to Mutual Information. My name is DJ. This video is part two on the exponential family, the baddest family in statistics. In part one, I explained what the exponential family is and how many distributions you've seen are special cases of it. In this part, I'll review some of its eternally useful properties. That includes something that all Bayesians love. There's a lot to get through, so let's jump right in. First, real quickly, let's review what the exponential family is. If the probability or density of a vector x given a parameter vector theta can be expressed like this, then it's within the exponential family. Here, h of x may make some values of x more or less likely regardless of the parameters. That said, a frequent choice is to set h of x to 1. t of x is a vector of sufficient statistics, meaning it measures everything that makes a difference for determining the probability of x in the eyes of the parameters. z of theta is the normalizer. It's there to ensure that integrating over all values of x yields a value of 1, as is required of any distribution. Finally, nu of dx refers to the measure of x, and it shows up in the integration of the normalizer. It's there to generalize the domain of x, which can be either discrete or continuous. With all that, the generality comes from the choices you could make. For certain choices of h of x, t of x, and the domain of x, you'll get a specific distribution, possibly one that you've seen before. At the same time, don't let that limit your impression of the flexibility here. Serious modelers may make very complicated choices to model complicated things. Okay, and a few other notes. Z of theta is not free to be chosen. It is forced to be something the moment you make those other choices. And also, we rule out any thetas which make the normalizer infinite. Got it? With that, the question we move to is, what are the awesome properties that follow from this genius generalized structure? Well, there are many. To communicate the first, I'm going to pick one of the simplest distributions from the family, the Bernoulli. In that case, the normalizer requires summing over only two values, either 0 or 1. h of x is 1, and t of x is just x itself. z of theta turns out to be e raised to theta plus 1. And now, I'm going to plot four functions, which will make this property clear. For all of them, the value of theta will vary along the horizontal axis. In the case of the Bernoulli, theta is just a single number, so we can do this. In the top left, along the vertical axis, will be the expected value of t of x. That is, for a specific value of theta, that gives a distribution of x, which implies some mean value of t of x. So we can ask, as we vary theta, how does the mean value change? Well, it looks like this. All right, nothing crazy yet, but there's more to a distribution than just its mean. What about its variance? Well, we could plot that as well. All right, so what's the big deal? Well, on the bottom left, let's also plot the derivative of the log normalizer. That is, the normalizer is a function of theta. So we're free to inspect the derivative of the log of that thing. Well, you get a function like this. Aha, interesting. They are the same. But what about over here? Well, let's plot the second derivative of the log normalizer. And you get, you guessed it, this. Interesting once again. So at least in this case, it looks like the functions that map from theta to the mean and variance of the sufficient statistics are the same as the first and second derivatives of the log normalizer. But does it generalize? Well, of course it does. If we were to consider the choices for the exponential distribution and created those plots, we'd see the same equivalence. Also, if we switch to the Poisson, and drew those plots, we'd see the same thing again. And in general, this holds. But I'm only showing easily plotted cases where the sufficient statistics and the parameters are one-dimensional. As you can guess, the idea generalizes to higher dimensions as well. In fact, let's state it in its generalized form. That is, the expected value of the sufficient statistics given theta is equal to the gradient of the log normalizer when evaluated at theta. Similarly, the covariance matrix of the sufficient statistics is equal to the Hessian of the log normalizer. If you don't know, the gradient and the Hessian are higher dimensional analogs of the derivative and second derivative. Okay, let's zoom out. Remember, theta determines the distribution of the sufficient statistics. What these equations tell us is, if you want important descriptors of that distribution, like their mean and covariance, then you need only take the gradient and the gradient of gradients, the Hessian, of the log normalizer. Sidebar. The mean and variance are called the first two cumulants of a distribution. Higher and higher derivatives give more cumulants, all of which completely describe a distribution. 
Now, if you'd like to understand why this is true, well, that's a tall order, but I can offer you this walkthrough of the algebra. That said, I don't think tracing through it will yield a ton of intuition, but it's a good place to start if you want to develop that on your own. Really, the magic comes from the exponential function, so you have to really totally understand that to internalize these equations. And if you haven't, well, me neither. Fortunately for us, it's not actually necessary that you know why it's true, just that it's true. With that, let's move on to maximum likelihood estimation for the family. As we'll see, this job is a bit easier in their house. First, let's consider a data set in the general case. That is, we have n observations of the vector x. Our goal is to find the theta that makes the data most likely. To do that, as you may know, we need to form the likelihood function. Now, here's the convenient thing. If we assume the distribution of each xi is from the exponential family and they're independent of each other, then the distribution of the whole data set is also from the exponential family. That's because if we were to relabel things like this, we realize it meets the required form. Now, as you likely know, if we care about maximizing the likelihood function to find the MLE parameters, we need only minimize the negative log likelihood. In our case, that takes an especially simple form. If we look at this, we see we have something linear, something which doesn't depend on theta, and the log normalizer, which seems to hold all our complexity. Now, it turns out the log normalizer is a convex function of theta, which means it's shaped something like a bowl. Since the log normalizer is convex, the negative log likelihood is convex, and that's really useful for searching for the MLE. That means there are no local minima, which means if we search until we find something that looks like a local minimum, we will be assured that it's in fact the global minimum. In other words, the moment we find a point where the gradient is zero, we can stop searching. We found the best answer there is. But I should make something clear. This doesn't mean there's only one theta that achieves that global minimum. There could be many, but we'll get back to that. For now, we can use this idea to get more out of our negative log likelihood. Convexity implies that whenever the gradient is zero, we are maximizing the likelihood. And it turns out that this is equivalent to saying something more informative. That is, the expected value of the sufficient statistics equal their average value seen in the data. And if you're curious about why this is true, then check this out. I'll refer to this as the observed equals expected condition. It's really important, so I'll state it differently. The parameter vector theta determines a distribution over x, which then implies an expected value of the sufficient statistics. If theta is chosen such that this expected value equals the average of the sufficient statistics we see in the data, then we know theta is in fact the maximum likelihood estimate. In fact, looking at this equation, you could say knowing the mean value of the sufficient statistics is just another way to specify the distribution. Well, it turns out, if you know the expected value of the sufficient statistics, we say you've specified the distribution by its mean parameters. This means, for your choices of the exponential family, there is an implied mapping between the mean parameters and the theta parameters. In contrast to the mean parameters, the theta parameters are formally called the conical parameters. We saw that earlier with this graph. Sometimes, that mapping is known precisely. This is the case for the familiar distributions we've seen. But in the general case, discovering this mapping can be a computationally intensive task. Actually, this makes me think. Now is a good time to survey some of the difficulties you can run into if you're too wild with your choices. First, you could find yourself with an intractable normalizer. Like in computer vision modeling, the normalizer might sum over all possible images, which is certainly impossible. In that case, you can't calculate a probability because you can't evaluate the normalizer. Second, if your choices yield a linear dependency in theta or the sufficient statistics, then you'll be dealing with a non-minimal representation. For example, if one sufficient statistics is some multiple of another, then you'll have this problem. This creates a problem when paired with a fact that I'll just straight up state. There is a one-to-one -one mapping between the mean and conical parameters if and only if your choices are minimal. If they are non-minimal, then there is an entire theta subspace which meets our expected equals observed condition. In other words, there are many values of theta which maximize the likelihood. More broadly, this means theta isn't identifiable. One consequence, among several, is it means your Hessian is non-invertible. So if you're using second order methods to search for the MLE, then it may break when it tries to invert the Hessian matrix. Also, it complicates things in the Bayesian world. Specifically, it makes inferring the parameter posterior tricky. And third, the MLE may not even exist. From what I've seen, this happens when your average observed sufficient statistics are on the edge of the space they exist within. 
In that case, optimizing for theta will result in values flying off to plus or minus infinity. For example, in the case of the Bernoulli, it's easy to see this will happen if your average observed statistic is one. Okay, at this point, we've covered a lot. And I understand if it's exhausting. I'm certainly exhausted myself. But the generosity of the exponential family doesn't depend on our stamina. So take a breather, digest the meal, and prepare for the next part, Bayesian statistics. Before we begin, fair warning. I'm going to assume you already know the fundamentals of Bayesian statistics. If you're this deep on the exponential family, I think that's a fair assumption. Okay, earlier I just declared our goal was to find the MLE of theta. But to a Bayesian, there is a more complete question to ask. Instead of looking for the most likely theta, you should ask for a whole distribution over theta. That is, you're interested in this function. With it, you can figure out how likely any given thetas are. But for this great prize, the Bayesians demand two things. The likelihood function, which we've been handling, and a prior distribution over theta, which is a bit extra. Now, it turns out, fortunately, that the Bayesians and the exponential family get along super well. The kids go to the same schools, they get dinner together, they celebrate the holidays together, they go camping, they're the best of friends. And it's for one reason, conjugacy. First, I'll define it for you. Conjugacy means that we choose the prior and the likelihood such that the posterior is of the same form as the prior. It turns out this is a super important property. It's here for computational tractability. Otherwise, you may find yourself needing to sum over a ridiculously huge space, which would stop you in your tracks. Now, let's describe conjugacy more narrowly for the exponential family. Here, the prior and the likelihood are both within the exponential family and therefore involve a total of six choices. Conjugacy means that those six are chosen such that the three that apply to the prior will also apply to the posterior. If these conditions are met, we say that the prior and the likelihood are a conjugate pair. To paint this picture more completely, I'll show how your six choices need to coordinate to yield a conjugate pair. It turns out we are free to choose the likelihood however we like. So we can express it like this, just like anything within the exponential family. I've given these functions a subscript L to indicate they are chosen for the likelihood. Now for the prior, we are also using the exponential family, which means we need to pick a fresh vector tau. Here, tau is a parameter dictating the distribution over theta. To differentiate the two, we say tau is a hyperparameter. With that, our prior needs to look like this. This shows that we are restricted in our choice of sufficient statistics of theta. Notice this expression involves the log normalizer from the likelihood. Regarding the domain of theta, it's implicit here that it's the same across the likelihood and the prior. Also, in anticipation of some algebra, I've separated the tau vector into these two pieces, one of which is a vector and one of which is a scalar. With that, we can move on to what we are really interested in, this the posterior distribution of theta given our data. I've added conditioning on the tau vector since this is required by our choice of prior. Now, if we do some algebra, which I'll show in a minute, we get this. If we compare this with the prior, we see they involve the same choices. This is the same and this is the same. Now, if we inspect this, we recognize that conditioning on the data just involves updating the vector we use to model theta in the prior to some other vector that depends on the data. This is a total luxury. Non-conjugate pairs can easily combine to produce distributions that are super hard to calculate. So we are fortunate that conditioning on the data reduces to such a simple operation. And if you're curious about the algebra, pause the video on this. All that's happening here is an application of Bayes' theorem, some rearranging and grouping of terms, and a little insight on the normalizer. All right, now, that's a lot, and it's pretty general. To actualize it, let's shift from this perspective and focus on an example. Let's say we'd like to do as the Bayesians suggest with this data, which is represented with a normalized histogram. Looking at this, it looks like the normal would serve us well. That means, as you've seen before, we'll make these three choices. It follows that theta has length two, so we can represent the parameter space as a 2D plane. A point in that space implies a specific distribution. Now, when the Bayesians weren't in our face, we were just concerned with finding the MLE, the point in that space that makes the data most likely. But the Bayesians say we can do better. They say we should estimate a whole distribution over theta. And notice what this means. If we were to sample theta vectors, we'd be sampling many distributions. It seems the Bayesians were onto something. This does feel like a richer output. But the question is, how do we determine a distribution like this that works as a conjugate prior? 
From earlier, we know our choices are restricted. It turns out it's fair to go with these, which require we specify a hyperparameter vector tau, which has length three. To represent tau, I'm going to plot tau one and tau two in this space as a point. I'll represent tau naught with its own axis. Now, if we move the tau vector, we notice the distribution over theta moves. And this sets us up for the punchline. That is, conjugacy means conditioning on the data will reduce to some shifting of this tau vector. To see that, let's bring back the data. Now, if we recall the update rule, all we need to do is move tau to the position given by the sufficient statistics. As you can guess, this implies a distribution over theta that matches our data. To emphasize, this is a big deal. We are lucky conditioning on the data reduces to such a simple operation. No crazy optimization or simulations necessary. It's just moving around vectors according to sufficient statistics. Easy. And at this point, it's easier to see what the Bayesians were talking about. A distribution over theta gives us an idea of how well we know theta. To see that, let's say we had this data, which as you could tell, there is less of. Now, if we do the same thing, we have a wider distribution over distributions, which means we are more uncertain of our fit. The Bayesians are smart people. That said, at this point, I should make a comment. The procedure I'm mentioning here isn't good modeling practice. It's really only to show the theory. In practice, the relevant conjugate pairs are typically well known, and they typically aren't expressed with respect to theta, but rather a more natural parameterization like the mean parameters. Under a change like that, what I've shown here is very close to what is known as the normal inverse gamma distribution. But with that, this is where I'll end the video. This leaves a few things uncovered, like maximum entropy, which hurts, but I'll have to connect the exponential family and maximum entropy in another video. So that leaves only one thing to say. Thank you for your focus.